Welcome. My name is Hans Peter, and we will talk about a project that has its origins in the master thesis of Sebastian, who will later on in the second part give you all the technical details while I will just blah blah. No. <laughs> um, and this thesis was only possible because we had two uh, more. Uh, advisors, one of them is uh, Dr. Florian Wilhelm, our principal data scientist at Innovex, and Professor Rettinger from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, who is now in Trier. So, what is this about? So, yeah, I was suggest suspecting that the battery is low, so we will do it like that. Um, what, why did we do that? So, basically, um, voice control interaction by voice today is used by almost everyone. This is, for me, very exciting because I was working in dialogue systems 10 years ago or so, and stuff really didn't work at all. And um, it's really nice to have all those devices and people interacting by voice. Um, for us, we had a um, special use case we had in mind, which is our vision, um, which is not what we solved yet, but what, what, where we want to go. We have an internal um, enterprise search engine at our company, and we have a chat system, and we would like to have a, uh, to make it possible to ask questions about facts in our enterprise, not enterprise company. Um, for example, <coughs> which employees do you know about Apache Spark? Or which projects did we use solar in yet, until now? Um, so, these kinds of questions go beyond that, what often is part of such voice control system, like it goes beyond the typical command like interactions like Alexa, switch the light on, or Okay, Google, uh, play my bad mood playlist or turn on the air conditioning would be nice. Um, but you need to answer factual questions. Um, and so the, the answers to uh, questions like this is usually hidden behind a barrier, behind a query language or an API. So, um, usually the, the vast majority of the popula population doesn't speak SQL natively, so we can't really access it by access that kind of information directly. And our goal was to build, to use machine learning, machine learning or um, in particular deep learning to overcome this barrier to build a model that basically translate, translate between natural language and such query languages. <clears throat> so, there are two possibilities to do that. One we call hard lookup, and one we, are, we will call soft lookup. What is hard lookup? Um, with hard lookup, we basically build a machine learning model that acts as a direct translator between natural language and the query language. So we have Google Translate that translates between English and German, and we have a similar model that translates between German and SQL, or Elasticsearch Query API. Um, <coughs> that sounds feasible because such models exist, but the problem here is 
that the trim model is not end-to-end -end trainable. That's not what do I mean by that? Usually in machine learning, you need training data. By now, everyone knows that. The more data, the better. Um, and for that kind of a model, we would like to train with samples of a question and the corresponding answer. Um, but we can't build such a model and train it because this database is in, p in between, and we can't integrate the database into our model. So it's not differentiable, and this way not end-to-end -end trainable. So what we need to do is we need to create another data set that is, consists of the question and the corresponding query. And that usually doesn't exist. We need to create it, and that is costly. So the second option, how to solve this problem, is so-called soft lookup. With the soft lookup, we basically build a model that contains all the information. So we somehow transfer the information from the database into a mathematical model, into a deep learning model. And we can do that by really pushing all the columns in there or train it on the, on the pairs. And then the information, the facts, they are basically cells in this, this model. Um, for example, memory networks work like that. And what the model learns then is basically a mathematical function that maps from the question to a fact. But that is, uh, has some drawbacks. First of all, you need a lot of training data to do that, again. Um, but um, the problem is all the information must fit into the into the deep learning model, so, and that it's usually in the um, in the main memory. And if you have a nice database containing all your facts, why do you want to transfer it from the database into your model? And the other thing is, it's hard to interpret. It's uh, as I said, it's basically a probability distribution. So it's basically that says the answer is X, but uh, the probability is high that this question answers to this fact. Um, so that's the downside of those soft lookup models. So the hard lookup looks nice because it is also interpretable, like we know to look at such a query statement and understand what it means and why this query probably would return the wrong answer, so we can better understand it. We have much more capacity. And that's why our approach was to find a solution to make the hard look up end-to-end -end trainable. And that's what Sebastian will talk about. OK, thanks. Do you hear me? I think so. Um, yeah, and as the title says, we are using deep learning, so we are using neural networks, deep neural networks. And in NLP, you will often see this four-step framework, which says, first you embed the inputs, then you encode, you attend, then you predict. And within the next slides, I will give you a brief idea how this works and then how we used it. So embedding means that we, you can imagine a neural network as a very complex um, function, and somehow, we are working with words, but we need to turn them into numerical values. So that's what embeddings do. In the previous talk, um, I understood it that way that they use TF-IDF, which is something different. Word embeddings are trained on large core processors. For example, word to vec by Google. There is Glove from Stanford University, and they train it, for example, on Wikipedia to extract a vector per word. So these embeddings typically you have dimensions 200, 300, 400 dimensional. And 
what you see here is a artificial, a fictional um, 2D representation of such words where we have a question, who was the writer of, the, of True Lies? And each dot in this diagram would represent one word, which is defined by two coordinates. The word who, represented by the green dot, would locate in the upper left, and the word writer in the lower right. And one assumption or one finding in the research of word embeddings was that they are able to capture certain relationships in natural language because they are trained on the objective to group similarities in the same um, areas. And as you can imagine, with 300 dimensions, you can capture different type of relationships. So for example, we assume that the word writer would be close to the word author in this vector space. In the original papers, they also stated that you, for example, can see that gender can, um, yeah, relations can be found and so on. So at the end of this phase, each word is represented by one vector. So in the next step, we use a recurrent neural network, more specifically a um, LSTM, a long short-term memory network, to transform these vectors per word into a one vector per sequence per question. Um, representation. So this blue box in the end is somehow related to, to the dots you saw on the previous slide. So this is the vector that represents our question, who was the writer of True Lies, and which is yeah, computed by our en encoder. I don't go into more detail here. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in the web with, which you can check out if you're interested. This vector representation is then passed to the decoder. So you see one decoder cell here, which is designed to predict words. So you just see one word here, but theoretically it predicts word by word, step by step, and uses as its input this context vector we created in the previous step. And if you imagine that you would need to summarize a news article, then this context vector would be corresponding to your intuition after you read the article for the first time. As soon as you want to write your summary, you would then refer back to the original article, read another line, or you highlighted something and so on, and use this in combination with your basic intuition of what the news article is about to write your summary. And this was the vague idea of what is known as attention, attention mechanisms in um, yeah, deep learning. And again, in the previous talk, the, the, both people spoke about BERT, which is a system, or, yeah, system trained on transformers which are only built on attention. So this is a big, big trend in um, the deep learning community at the moment. So now we are at the state that our model predicted one token, we had our question, this is our model like from the previous slides, and we predict multiple tokens to fill this query template. So we used, in our uh, experiments, we used Elasticsearch and we designed it that way that we capture three fields. The most important is the query condition, which captures the entity of the question. So the question was, who was the writer of True Lies? And we, with our model, we predict the start and end token of this entity, so we can handle entities of different lengths. The query field is then used to identify which category this entity belongs to. So here, True Lies is a movie title. And in the end, the response field predicts or captures which category we, we want to retrieve from our Elasticsearch. And to perform this prediction, our model has access to a vocabulary which is defined by some uh, by the database categories and by the um, tokens from, from our input questions. And that's why it's able to predict these tokens. We then operate this query via an interface on the Elasticsearch, which returns a response. But as Hans-Peter discussed earlier, 
we can't train directly on this feedback because it's non-differentiable. And there is a workaround when you use reinforcement learning. Again, that's a big topic uh, at the moment, and I won't go into details here. But to give you a quick idea how we did it is we provided rewards. So like little, imagine a crowd, crowd worker who would do this work, and he would gain different um, money or different rewards, financial rewards, to s solve a task. So if he produces invalid queries, he would need to pay two euros, for example. And we defined invalid queries in that way that it either causes an error or that the database response is empty, so no result was retrieved. Furthermore, um, he would need to pay one euro if he produced a valid query, but the result was wrong. So for the, for the movie Who Was the Writer of True Lies, when he would retrieve a year or another direct, uh, um, movie writer, then the model would get a penalty on this um, performance. And finally, what we are looking for is valid queries with correct results. And in our initial experiments, we provide a small positive reward, plus one. And as you can see with the star, we varied that in our experiments because we found that it had quite, an, quite a big impact on the results we found. So we evaluated our model on the movie dialogue data set, which is provided by Facebook, which is open source. And the data set contains about 96,000 questions about movies and a database with 17,000 um, movies and facts about it. For example, the writer, the actors, and so on. Um, we stored the metadata in the Elasticsearch and gave our model access via this um, interface. And now I will show you what we found, what we learned during this um, project. So first, as I said, we found that, or we varied the rewards in our experiments because we found that they changed the performance of our system. In the beginning, with small positive rewards, our model always predicted the same kind of query. Very simple. It was kind of a lazy prediction because it tended to predict the major or the, the predominant category, which was the movie title, and one word of the question. So for example, just the first word. And by this, it achieved that all, almost all queries were valid. So 99% of the queries were valid, but it retrieved no correct results at all. So that was not what we aimed for. So we experimented a little around, and we found that by increasing the positive rewards for the valid queries and correct results to 25, which was yeah, an empir empirical choice in the end, we found that we were able to improve our performance. So the share of varied queries was reduced, but we were able to score almost 50% or more than 50% of the um, correct results. But still, after analyzing these results, we found, OK, our model became better at predicting the entities. So it varied the length depending on the question. It was able to handle questions with just one word as the entity, for example, Titanic, or true lies with two words, and so on and so on. It also identified the corresponding uh, category correctly, but the output category, the output field, was still yeah, dominated by the major, major category in the data set, which is why we used a little trick which is called exploration bony. And the intuitive idea is that you provide an extra reward, extra financial motivation, let's to say, to motivate the model to try something new. So uh, assuming that it had 100 predictions and it always said, OK, give me the movie name, then we would pr provide a little positive reward to say, OK, if you try two times to receive the genre or the language the movie was in, um, try it out. and we'll see if you improve. So that was the result from the previous slide from our minus 1, minus 2, plus 25 rewards without the reward bony. And with reward bony, like this motivation to try something new, we found that our model 
improved significantly. So we gained a boost of around 30%, which was really impressive, um, in, in my opinion. And then we thought, OK, how good can we get? Is there a way that we experiment a little more and engineer a little to, to even improve more? But first, we checked how good can we get, because in the data set, we found that natural language, for sure, is ambiguous. It was a, yeah. We could have gotten this idea earlier, because there is this example. There are four movies called The Three Musketeers in the data set. So if I would ask you, um, in which year was the movie The Three Musketeers released, and you would have access to this database with the information in it, I think more people would tend to predict the number that corresponds to the newest movie, but still there would be um, people voting for the other three movies. And these ambiguous entities in the data set accounted for about 4%. Four, four Additionally, we, sa okay, we said we wanted to stay end-to-end. -end. That's why we used reinforcement learning. So we used the question and as the input, and evaluate or provided rewards for our model um, to learn. And that was, yeah, the thing I was talking about before. And we scored 84.2% here. And then we checked, OK, how good can we get if we are not in the end-to-end -end setting, but we use these intermediate labels, which are available. Doesn't matter how costly they are at the moment, because in the data set they were available. And we showed that we could score around 6% better. So we see that there is this trade-off that if it's possible to use this intermediate label, then there is a little improvement. But if these are not available because it's too costly to label them, then even with only reinforcement learning, we can score quite good. There is one little. Uh, problem with the reinforcement learning part. These are the results I showed you before, and they are, um, they, the models achieved these results on the large data set, the 96,000 questions. When we reduced the samples by random sampling to 10,000, 10, we found that the intermediate label approach was quite stable, but reinforcement learning suffered a lot, and yeah, the results were not good at all. But yeah, sure, it could be we didn't do much optimizing for reinforcement learning, but we, we stuck with the same setting. So there's still space for improvement with the reinforcement learning algorithm with our setting at all. Um, or maybe it's not possible to score better with reinforcement learning. And another aspect that we found, reinforcement learning took lay, uh, way longer during training. So it took 12 hours on the large data set with reinforcement learning and one hour with intermediate labels, a certain part of this training time accounts for the interaction with the elastic search, which we have in the reinforcement learning setting, but not in the intermediate label setting, um, where we could do maybe optimize a little by um, scaling up the elastic search. And now I want to come back to the point where Hans Peter was comparing soft lookup and hard lookup, because that's yeah, an interesting question as well. We compared both systems. The one is end-to-end -end trainable by default. We only need to input the database. And our approach is end-to-end -end trainable with this little hack. So these are our results, and these were the results that were reported by the paper um, of Dutch et al. So we have memory networks, which are on a competitive level to our system. And we have a sp specialized QA system on embeddings that we can approach with our intermediate labels system. So there is none of these two approaches, neither soft lookup nor hard lookup, that really outperforms the other in a significant way. So it, again, depends on the problem. Is it useful to extract a part of your database, feed it to the soft lookup, or is it OK to just use reinforcement learning, or if you have the intermediate labels, to use this other approach to solve your problem. So what did we learn? We 
applied a sequence to sequence approach with yeah, pointer attention to create database queries from natural language question. In the beginning, we were quite skeptical if, that, if this would work, but in the end, it did for a, to, a, to a certain degree. Furthermore, we overcame the problem of non differentiability, which we didn't thought be about before as well, um, and thereby avoided to produce costly intermediate labels. And again, um, with the trick of exploration bony, we were able to overcome this lazy behavior of our network to predict just one category at all. And sure, there is a road to continue. We could aim for, or we will aim for more complex questions and different corpora. At the moment, we are really centered, or we were centered around this one data set, so we need to try other da data sets from different domains, even open domain data sets with more complex questions. So at the moment, we had questions with one entity in them, and you couldn't, for the movie domain, for example, imagine that who was the director of a movie with Bruce Willis from the year 2014 or in language Japanese or in language English. Furthermore, as I described, we need to improve the sample efficiency of reinforcement learning because, as you saw, with this two data set, there was a big decrease. And sure, we need to work on the latencies of our database interaction or the reinforcement learning interaction with the database at all to improve. And yeah, there have been some developments in the NLP community, which the previous talk again talked about as well. Um, so this BERT model seems to provide a nice idea or a nice um, way to expand our approach and maybe score better and achieve better results. And if you want to read more about this talk in a more detailed way or if it was information overload, I suggest that you have a look at our blog. We have a blog post related to this um, work. We submitted a paper on a research conference, and now we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, the question? Yeah, I start with you. Uh, I was wondering, cost-wise, did you compare the hard lookup and soft lookup for the f infrastructure? Of um, the both? Yeah, we didn't implement the soft lookup by ourselves. So for our approach, we used one GPU server uh, or one GPU, and it took 12 hours for one training loop. Um, for the soft lookup, I don't know if the authors of the paper reported these numbers, but I can imagine that it's quite resource intense as well. And it was a Google paper. Of Facebook paper, I Facebook. think, as well, so they had uh, some resources to, to train on. Uh, my question was about your no results queries. So you said that you give a penalty for any response that had no results, but I imagine a valid question might not be answerable given the data set. So it makes me assume that maybe your data set doesn't have any questions for which the correct answer is empty. Uh, but I'm, So then my follow-up is, uh, would that change your approach if you have to handle that? in some fundamental way, or is it just a difference in the data? Can, can you repeat the end? I didn't How do you handle no results queries that are valid? In other words, I ask a question like, what movie has me starring as Batman? Yeah. Yeah, and there okay. is no I such movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, in the end, our model, before we predict, or while we are predicting, the model outputs somehow a probability distribution as well. And you could set the benchmark, so if the model is not sure what does me mean, and then the distribution goes into the uniform direction. So you could say, okay, if it's below the benchmark, then do nothing. Also, uh, we just knew that for this data that there weren't uh, any correct queries with zero results. So. Um, 
if you want to generalize that, uh, we would remove that um, penalty, which would probably uh, make the model to converge uh, slower because it has uh, fewer uh, information available, but it would work. And it's a really interesting question if you consider questions where multiple answers may be correct. So there is comes with the design of the reward function in the end. You can play around there. Hi. Uh, yet another question. Uh, you mentioned that you, uh, you used embeddings. Uh, did you use pre-trained embeddings like GLOVE or word to vec Yeah, we use GLOVE with uh, 300 dimensions okay. and I tra did uh, you trained on the 42 billion Wikipedia did, corpus. Did you try var like variations of uh, dimensionality in embeddings and did you observe like difference between uh, different flavors of embeddings at all? Um, no, so far we just work with the GLOVE embedding, but I can imagine that if we use this contextual embeddings like, like BERT, for example, then we would uh, yeah, have yeah, some sure. more. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious about the invalid queries that were malformed. Did you consider, oh, gosh, the feedback. Uh, did you consider training your system to have a classifier for such queries to avoid sending them in the first place? I just think such a mechanism might work better. I think I didn't understand the question acoustically. Sorry, I'll try again. Um, the echo or feedback makes it hard, yeah. though. Um, I was just wondering if you tried a classifier for detecting malformed queries, because it seems to me like a lot of the malformed queries should be classifiable before ever reaching the Elasticsearch setup. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, no, we didn't. But yeah, to put it into production or to develop it further, it's definitely necessary, I think, yeah. You could, you could do that. Part of why we did it uh, is also because this kind of research, uh, the interesting part is that models like this are able to learn, for example, SQL just by tri uh, trial and error, which is fascinating. So there are different other models that learn SQL by using reinforcement learning, and they make errors. And that's, uh, for a practical uh, case, you would probably use some engineering and shortcuts and that nice stuff. But uh, we also wanted to do some research. Fair enough. I just was curious, because oftentimes, policy networks have helped uh, in these sorts of applications. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Other question here? Mm, no. OK. Thanks, Gay. I suppose that Thank you is for enough. Listening. <laughs> Thanks.